Greetings, my friend. What a joy to be able to connect with you again today as we continue on our series about dreams and visions as they pertain to the Christian household and the Christian family. What an amazing truth it is. What a joy it is to know that our God loves to communicate with us in this deeply personal and intimate way. That means that He wants to communicate with you in this way as well. And so I don't think I'm breaking any new ground with this series. I don't think that I'm coming to show you something entirely new. No, the Bible records all over the place how people, men and women of God, have had dreams and visions that have directed them, and some of them, even the types of dreams and visions that steer and counsel and give an insight into the course of human history. Now, I want us to change gears a little bit this morning. I I want us to start looking at things from a bit of a different angle. You know, so often we jump straight into uh, what dreams and visions are. I've heard so many teachings that will jump straight into, you know, the prophetic dreams and dreams about end times, eschatological things. And that's all good. We'll get there in just a bit of time. But you know, we need to lay the proper foundations first. And so uh, we've laid some foundations as they pertain to dreams and desires and dreams and personal directions in your life. But today I want to speak about how do we condition our minds, how do we condition and quieten our spirits to receive dreams and visions from God. You know, uh, dreams and visions are like all things. If our minds are too scatty and too cluttered, we can't hope to receive anything from God. Uh, God expects us to shut out the noise. God expects us to shut out all those distractions so that we can put Him first and communication with Him first. You know, so many people say, well, God does, just doesn't talk to me in that way. Here's my question. Do you prioritize hearing from God in that way? It all has to do with shutting out the noise first. Just to lay a bit of a foundation, I want to read from Scripture this morning. And it's going to take us more than one day to get through all the content of what I, what I want to show us here this morning. But let's just lay a foundation and begin reading together. I'm reading from the book of Philippians. Uh, please feel free to pause this DVD, to pause this message right now, and just get out your own Bible, your own translation, and see what the Lord is saying. If your translations say things differently or put, put things differently, make a note of those differences. Go look into them, and uh, you'll be richly blessed. Anyway, let's read what Paul says to the Philippian church. Philippians chapter 4, I just take it from verse 4 there for now. Uh, there the, uh, I'm going to read from verse 4, but, in, but actually I want to get into verse 5. But verse 4 puts a bit of context. You may know this as a memory verse. So, let's read. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. There it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. And then Paul carries on to show us what rejoicing means. Some of the definition. It's, just, it's not just about being happy, dancing around and clapping and stomping your feet. Although, if that's the way you want to express yourself, all power to you. Praise the Lord. But here's something else that he shows about rejoicing. He says, Re- let your reasonableness be known to everybody. Oh boy. Is there a sermon right there? In fact, a series of sermons about the reasonableness of a Christian. We mustn't be threatened when people speak differently to us. We mustn't be threatened when they present views that are different to ours. No. Reasonableness means we need to be able to sit down, dialogue, and present our case before people. But let's carry on. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. And then Paul goes on to say, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You you see how Paul just taps in there with what I started speaking about. Paul speaks about the peace of God, and I was talking about tuning out that noise, tuning out those distractions. That's what the peace of God will do for you. It will allow you to tune out those distractions that are going to rob you of hearing from God. 
So this morning, everything that I'm speaking about has to do with the peace of God. You know, I also want to say that when you pray, uh, when you come to the Lord in prayer, it, it's, it's not just a, a monologue. It's not just going to God and saying, hey God, and just reciting things of your heart. There's dialogue that happens. And by dialogue, I don't just mean hearing the voice of God, but I'm saying feeling the presence of the Lord, getting an impression from the Lord, allowing God to minister to that place where deep cries out to deep, where soul just cries out to soul and spirit to spirit. And you allow God to connect with that and you allow him to imprint on your heart and in your thoughts those things that are of him. But also I want to go a little bit further. You know, when we speak about dreams and visions, um, I've become acutely aware that you can be more in your g- dreams than, than, than just uh, a witness. You can become more in your dreams than just a passive observer. You can actually become a participator in the dreams that come your way. In fact, I think that it's God's delight when you start developing the ability to actually participate in your dreams. Not just have things said to you, but actually enter into a dialogue as such. Now, there's been all sorts of scientific studies that are showing different techniques that the person can develop. And it's all very scientific stuff. There have been journals that have been written. Uh, t- techniques that allow you to become more of a participator in your dream, especially people that have traumatic dreams, how to tune those things out, and so the therapy that goes with it. But I'm not talking about participating in your dreams from just a merely scientific point of view. No, there's far too, more to it than just science. Uh, I- I'm dreaming, speaking about the types of dreams that Scripture speaks about. Uh, scripture clearly shows how certain people participate in their dreams. Let's think, for example, of the prophet Zechariah. Now, he had a dream of an angel, and an angel was telling him all sorts of things to do with Joshua, who would be the high priest. And he said uh, about Joshua, that is, Zechariah said about Joshua to the angel, he said, put a clean turban on his head. Put a clean turban on Joshua's head. So can you imagine the dream? Yeah, they are. They're dreaming about Joshua. To cut a long story short, there was Joshua. He was he was dressed in filthy rags. He was being accused by the devil. And, and the whole essence of this was restoring Joshua to his correct place. Uh, the correct place, that is, the, the high priesthood. And, and Zechariah said to the angel, put a turban on his head. Go ahead. And that, that essence of turban, it had to speak with dignity. It had to speak with a, 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 into authority and headship. And, you, you know, just Zechariah making mention of that, just Zechariah making that request, changed the course of the dream. And, and I believe God tailored it that way. God knew that Zechariah would have that kind of input. This wasn't the first spiritual dream that Zechariah had had. And I believe he had to develop the ability to participate in these kinds of dreams. And, and by the way, do you notice in that Zechariah 3 verse 5, you can go and read about it yourself. The angel listened to Zechariah. He heard him when he said, And Joshua was crowned with a glorious turban, a turban of authority and headship. Isn't that beautiful? Now this is what I'm speaking about. I I want us to come to a place where we can do more than just witness. I, I believe that God instills things in our spirit where he wants us to be able to participate. What he instills into you during your waking hours that it affects the way that you dream as well. Well, I, I remember I uh, spoke to my daughter Emma now, uh, right now at the time of this recording, Emma, six years old, heading towards being seven uh, in November. And what an, an awesome age that is. I'm ex- absolutely delighting in my children. We are enjoying them so much. Anyway, the other night I was busy putting Emma to bed and we were saying our prayers. And, um, you know, right after our prayers, after she had said amen, I said to her, I said, now my sweetheart, listen to daddy now. Before you fall asleep, you must think beautiful thoughts. Because if you have beautiful thoughts, you'll have beautiful dreams. 
Isn't that true? And, and you know, even on a, on, a, on a strictly normal, natural level, that's true in so many ways. If you want to have beautiful dreams, before you go to sleep, get rid of all the mess, man. Don't focus on the people that have got their knives out for you. Don't focus on that major boardroom meeting coming up tomorrow. I mean, these are things that just work you up. You're not going to have a good night's rest. There comes a point where you've done all the preparation you can do. Uh, you've done all the thinking you can do. Just before bed, your thoughts should not be there. I, I believe that when it comes to our spiritual walk, before we go to sleep, our meditations need to be on heaven. Our meditations need to be on the Word of God. Our meditations need to be on the things of God. Be surprised how just that discipline for the Christian starts impacting on your dream life. Through consistent meditation on God's Word, we have the ability to transform our dreams from being something that is earthly and carnal to being something that is spiritual and rich and the source of it is from heaven. You know, the Apostle Paul said to the Colossians in Colossians 3, 3 verse 2, he said, set your minds on things that are above. Paul was saying, hey, don't set your mind on earthly things. Don't, don't, don't do that. Now listen, we know that there are times where earthly things are going to require your mind. We know that. You, you, you have to. I mean, you're doing life. So there's times that you're going to have to apply your mind to paying the bills. There's time that you're going to have to apply your mind to your work. There's times that you're going to have to apply your mind to conflict resolution. All things. Yeah, we understand that. But there's a difference between applying your mind to these things and setting your mind. Paul says, that place where you set your mind, that needs to be in heaven. So sure, there's going to be times where you need to allow your mind to dip in and dip out as you participate on worldly affairs. Yeah, of course, we have to. But when you set your mind, you need to set your mind on things above. Now the prophet Isaiah wrote something very similar. The prophet Isaiah said, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Isaiah 26 verse 3. Look at the language. Because his mind is stayed. I believe Paul would have said his mind is set. What happens to the person whose mind is stayed in Christ? What? What? Well, there it is. God keeps him in perfect peace. And if you're in perfect peace in your waking thoughts, you're going to be in perfect peace in your dreams and in the visions that you come your way. I think it's beautiful the way these things just line up. And it's amazing how just a few little practical steps like this can open the whole doorway to have a spiritual impact in your life. Have you ever heard the saying, you are what you think? We've heard the saying, you are what you eat. But other people have said, you are what you think. I, I think yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, I've known a whole bunch of people who are nothing at all what they think. <laughs> really, they, they've just got this opinion of who they are. And when you weigh the reality of the matter compare, and you compare it with who they actually think they are, boy, world of difference. Eh? There's other people that think far too little of themselves. So in that sense, they're also not what they think. And these are the kind of people you want to say, hey man, step up to the plate. Get with it. You're, you're far more than you think you are. You've got more to offer than you think you have to offer. You're thinking of yourself in this lowly way, but I want to tell you, nobody else in our community thinks of you like that. You think you have nothing to offer, but can I tell you, you're actually an encourager. You think you have nothing to offer, but man, when we were going through that crisis, who was the first person all of us looked to? Hey? So, so, so there are many senses where we are what we think we are. There are other senses where we're not at all what we think that we, the, the person that we think that we are. Sometimes people think that we're the tough ones or the heroic ones until we face that adversity, until we face that time of uh, danger. Uh, you know, and, and we find when, you know, when we're in the comfort of normalcy, we, we have a certain way of thinking about ourselves. But boy, when, when something out of the ordinary happens, maybe adversity or a dangerous situation, we look back on it and we think, wow, 
I didn't respond in that situation at all like I thought I would. I, um, I know that there's a certain uh, technical term. I don't even know what, what they call that technical term. Go look it up for yourself, man. But there was a thing I was reading about a couple of years ago. I think it might be in the Reader's Digest magazine. It was a short story about a man and a woman who, who were shipwrecked or should I say more like yacht wrecked, yeah, wrecked or boat wrecked out in very stormy seas. And this was a tough guy, man. I mean, he was a mariner. Sailing was his thing. Uh, it was just him and the wife uh, out on that boat by themselves. And he was holding things together. Cut a long story short. Heavy storm comes their way. Uh, capsizes their boat. I mean, we got waves that are massive, you know, and they're doing this thing and storms and wind lashing and you can picture it. When the helicopter came to save them, they threw in some of these life jackets and, you know, these life uh, uh, hoops that people put around them. You know what this tough guy did? He literally pushed his wife under the water to give himself buoyancy so that he could get to the life jacket that was thrown his way. Well, needless to say, that couple needed a bit of counseling after that. Nobody would have said he would have done that type of thing. Nobody would have said. But yet again, for those of us that think we're a bit of a tough guy, how would you react in time of danger? Peter said to Jesus, Lord, though they all walk out on you, no ways, Lord, I'm going to stand with you. Jesus said, mm, yeah, okay, let's see what happens when that rooster starts crowing right so there are ways that perhaps we think of ourselves in time of normalcy where when the push comes to crunch it shows us it shows us that we're not quite who we thought that we were and, and let me just say to you recognizing these vulnerabilities and recognizing these weaknesses is not a bad thing a very good a very good to be able to get a reality check and see who we are compared to who we think that we are. These things come and shape our thinking about who we are. Sometimes we get a reality check. We say, oh goodness, okay, hold on one second. Uh, there's a difference here. I, I need to work on this aspect of who I am. I, I need to work on that weakness that was revealed in me. It's a good thing if we're honest about it. It's a good thing if we allow these things to help us take stock of our shortcoming. Very good thing if we allow it to shape, listen to me carefully, to shape our thinking about ourselves, about who we are. And by shape, I mean correct, I mean balance, I mean in time broaden. There are times that our thinking can be very provincial, man. Just, mm, we need to broaden our thinking in certain areas as well. Now, the word here that I believe would properly sum up what I'm trying to say is the word sober. Let's start thinking soberly about ourselves. Let's start thinking soberly about who we are and the way that we face situations and thinking. Uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 5, the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, he says, Timothy, you must always be sober-minded. In other words, not just a little bit, not every now and then. You need to make it your practice that the way that you think about things is a sober pattern of thought. When? At all times. At all times, think soberly about things. Why? Well, we just read about it in the book of Philippians. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. Oh boy. I mean, if we think about it, now more than ever. Remember, I spoke a little while ago that the church needs to have this expectation all the time that the Lord is at hand. That's what made the church so powerful back in the first century. That's something that is sorely missing in many of our churches nowadays is this expectation the Lord is at hand. Well, I thank God for some of the craziness that is happening in our world around us right now. Not because of the craziness itself, but because some of the craziness that is happening in, in world politics, in weather patterns, in, wow man, some of the craziness is a sober thought. It is a sobering action to come and remind us that the Lord is at hand. Man, there have been some non-Christians that have been shaken up a little bit 
by the things that are happening in the world. Because they come to see that all the things that the church has been saying for such a long time, they're lining up with the world events that we're living in right now. That's exciting times. But I want to tell you, even in these exciting times, we who are the sons and daughters of the Most High God need to think soberly about the times that we're living in. We, we, we need to have a mindset of eager expectation. We need to have a mindset of, of, of almost yearning to see our Lord revealed. When Paul writes of this expectation, this blessed hope, notice what Paul says when he speaks in the context of the Lord being at hand. What Paul writes is so very different to so many of the messages that I hear from pulpits and things that I see even on the internet in today's age. Uh, so much of what I, what I hear is, I hear, well, God is at hand. Come on, you need to get ready. You need to be frantic. Come on, let's run around. Let's do things. You need to get the message out. You need to get the word out. Yeah. Missed the plot. Missed the plot. L listen, listen. Paul doesn't say, hey, guys, Jesus is coming, and boy, is he mad. No, no, no. Pa Paul doesn't say, hey, do you know the end of all things is happening? It's almost the end of the world. You need to run out into the forest. You need to build a bunker somewhere couple of hundred meters below the earth and stock up and turn goods. Paul doesn't write anything like that. Nothing. You know, you know what Paul writes? He says, God is near. The time is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. His coming is imminent. Could be any day now. Yeah, we know that. When we look at world events, we know that. But we don't. the world events are not our authority. We've always known that because we've looked at the pages of Scripture, right? And, and, and what is it that Paul says? Do not be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about the mark of the beast. Do, that, that falls under the, the anything. Don't be anxious about the Antichrist coming. Come on, we, we're going to be in heaven when these things unfold. The rapture will happen before those things unfold. Different message, right? Don't be anxious about the stores running out of food. Don't be anxious about the state of the healthcare systems right now. D don't be anxious about the deep state. Now, listen, we, we are soldiers, man. We, we mustn't be caught up in civilian affairs. Our, ours is not here to be caught up in that type of panic. No. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Listen. And the peace of God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, it, it's, in, it's precisely in these times, in these times of difficulty, in these times, almost as if, I mean, Jesus put it like, like labor, you know, stages of labor, and you, you see the contractions coming. It's in these times of upheaval that we need to hear from God more than ever before. And yes, I know that we have the authority of Scripture. I know that we have the Bible, but I'm talking about in this deep and personal, reassuring way that God has said He Himself wants to speak to His church. It's in these times that we need to be peaceful people. Peaceful. That's the catch words that I believe that we get out of the Scripture. What kind of people will mark the end time church? Grateful. Peaceful. Prayerful. Not people running around. Come on, man. We need to be the light. We need to be the salt. While everybody else is running around frantic, they should be looking to the church, and the church should be peaceful, grateful, prayerful. We need to be the stability of these times. We need to be the anchor of these times. Why? Because we know that the Lord is at hand. We know that the Lord is at hand. And for us, that's not a bad thing. For us, that's good news. This, this, this is not a different Jesus. This is not a foreign Jesus to us. It's the same Jesus that we've been praying to all along. It's the same Lord that we know has been the Lord that sticketh closer than a brother. It's been the same Lord that we've run to. It's been the same God that has had us covered under the shadow of His wings. That's who is coming one day. And so for us, it, it's a source of great delight. It's a source of great enthusiasm. It's a, a source of great peace to us. 
We're not afraid of a world that is falling apart. Our, our focus is upon that place where our, cit our true citizenship truly belongs in the next kingdom to come. Isn't this just so different to all those voices out there right now? All those voices that are, yeah, they sound sensational. Some of them even in the church, yeah, they sound sensational. But you know what? Mm. They, they cause a lot of unnecessary concern. Now, now, when I speak about the peace of Christ, I'm not talking about disengage. No, the church is engaged in our times. We're, we're engaged in our society. We're, we're engaged in our communities. So I don't mean disengage. I mean disentangle disentangle from all those things that are tripping you up disentangle from those things that are that are inhibiting your ability to engage properly disentangle from those things that are inhibiting your ability to dream properly and communicate and receive from god properly what, what i'm talking about is i'm talking about free your thoughts so that you can dream free those thoughts liberate them liberate those things you you, you know the things that are grinding you you know those things that are keeping you up at night? Let me ask you this question. If you knew, like you knew, that Jesus would be here in the next hour, how much attention would you be paying to those things? Huh? This is the kind of mindset that Paul is telling us that we need to have. The Lord is at hand. More than ever, the Lord is at hand. And that shouldn't cause you to run around frantically. That should cause you to minister, but to minister with a sense of serenity and peace. Why? Because our God has got this. None of this is taking him by surprise. This is working out perfectly according to his master plan. Let me tell you something. You are a part of his master plan. That should give us great peace. Peace.